I think that uh, the fundamental principles of DDD are quite stable things, but as the technology shifts and as the style of architecture shifts, a lot of the details of how we do it change quite a bit. In some ways, as those changes happen, I think it helps clarify what those deeper principles are. Because when I wrote the book in the early 2000s, the range of architectural platforms was actually is pretty uh, much a monoculture. There was a lot of Java sitting on top of, of uh, J2E, or in some cases, Spring. And so I described how to do this thing in that kind of platform. And a lot of the solutions I described were sort of object-oriented solutions. As things have shifted, like toward, say, microservices or functional programming, these things emerging, then it's very interesting to think about how would you do it in that new platform. Sometimes you say, well, that doesn't really make much difference. Sometimes you say, oh, that really helps me. It makes it easier. For example, microservices I think makes it easier to identify a bounded context, which is one of the fundamental principles of DDD, and yet it's kind of abstract and hard to, to uh, identify. Sometimes with, like, say, functional programming, you say, well, can I make the same kind of sort of language readable code that I had in the object-oriented world? I think you can, but you have to really think differently about it. But, you know, DDD has already been through some big changes. It's been, I don't know, at least five years since event sourcing and CQRS came along. And that really changed the way we did it. Much more about representing events and processing events and less emphasis on objects even then or on changing state. So I think, it, as you say, it is evolving. And uh, that's a good thing. As it does, the, the real essence of it helps. Yeah, that helps to get the real essence of it more distilled. DDD is really an approach to handling complexity in the domain. So if you have a, a business problem that's very intricate and complex, DDD may be able to help. If you have just a lot of data, but it isn't intricate, it's not uh, complex to understand, DDD won't bring a whole lot of value to that. Uh, so <clears throat> that's really the area. And of course, you also need the kind of team that can do it. You'll need to be working in a place where there's enough uh, sort of architectural discipline to pull off a sophisticated approach to software development. I think those are the th that, that would be the things you need. And then, as I say, it's a way of dealing with a very intricate and complex domain. Uh, but it's not a solution for all software problems. One thing I would say is, I don't think that BDD in particular is an alternative. What I would view it as a... Uh, in domain-driven design, we say that you want to collaborate with business people to explore models and work out a ubiquitous language that you can really define terms precisely to be able to express things within the domain very clearly. I would say BDD is a way of structuring that activity. So it goes more, uh, it's more prescriptive in the sense that it, it really tells you how to do that part more systematically than DDD does. DDD just kind of says you need to do that and there might be many ways you could do it, but you better do that. And then once you've got this language, you want to do this with it. And a lot of the other stuff, BDD doesn't really speak to that so much. It doesn't say, well, how do you actually build the software? They're really focused on the conversations between technical and, and business people and how to make that conversation very productive. So I think that those are actually pretty complementary techniques. I would, I would put it like that, rather than um, <clears throat> that BDD is one of the ways you can structure your interactions with business people. Um, at this conference, Alberto Brandolini is talking about 
event storming. That's another way of structuring the interaction between software people and uh, business people. And again, trying to bring about a productive, creative interaction that can help you get a model that you can use in your software. Again, I would say that that's very complementary to domain-driven design, even a sort of a thing you would need. You need some approach to that. Now, uh, but there are many diff uh, there are many alternatives, of course, and uh, I would admit to being somewhat biased. I, I don't think I can very objectively evaluate uh, the true alternatives, uh, except to say that I really I do think that different things work better for different types of people. So I don't think, uh, I would never say domain-driven design is the way to do it, or even within a specific kind of problem. If you have a complex domain, which is where DDD helps, DDD is the way to do it, I would never say that, so. It depends on people who are doing that. Yes, I think it depends to a great extent on the type of mind they have, you know. I have a certain, my mind works in certain ways. For example, I find that uh, language, the language we use when we talk about things gives me a lot of insight into how to quantify and structure the problem, how to s build the software. Some people like a visual approach to things, you know, not that I don't use a visual ever, but some people like to draw a picture of things, and that's kind of their primary mode of thinking. And I think if you, th we'll just have to have different, some people, the code is the only thing that means much of anything to them. They say, just write the code and the rest of it is all just uh, meaningless flapping gums. I don't think that, I, I think the code is very important. You know, I don't think you should do very much design before you start coding stuff. but. But I think there is a lot of other kind of thinking and interacting that I find valuable to, that I want to do outside of the coding. So there are really different, there really diff are different ways. And I think the biggest factor is probably that different people think differently.